Okay, everyone. Nice, Nick Farr. He just ran downstairs, so please uh, l let him get some air first. Okay, check, check. Hello? All right, good evening, everybody. I'm glad to see that this is a packed room. Um, I'm really sorry I'm late, but they wrapped me in this. <laughs> I'm actually not kidding. At, at, at the worst possible time, I think uh, all of it, maybe... Well, I, I kind of whispered in Honk's ear, like, it's time to stop making sex jokes in Saw 1 and time to, uh, <laughs> and time to get me, because I actually have to be on stage somewhere else. And he was like, oh, I'm sorry, we didn't know that, I'm sorry. And so they, him and Bug Blue pick me up off the stage and then carry me off, rip it off, and then I come running down here. <laughs> Don't give them any ideas like that. <laughs> okay. I'm, I really hope it's not. <laughs> but it probably is already on YouTube. <laughs> okay, anyway, thank you. Um, I just wanted to thank, um, again, Shaq Space for being so awesome. I know I'm wearing a Ramsay Labor lab coat. Uh, can we get a round of applause for these guys? Seriously. Thank you. I, you know, I'm, I'm very honored to be here and to give this talk. This is exactly what we were talking about at the camp. Um, and I'm glad to see that Shaq Space has taken the ball, picked it up, and started running with it. Because, as I was trying to explain at the camp, today's networks are evil. They're based on old technology. This is exactly the kind of thing I was saying. We should... Oh, what? You're one behind. I'm one behind? That's the next one. That's the current one. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm... I apologize. <laughs> Um, and, and I was just saying, why don't we have connections everywhere? Why is it so difficult to get connected? Why are people who live in rural areas or people who aren't, uh, you know, in heavily urban areas have really fast connectivity just because they don't live um, in the right place? Uh, why is the old technology not allowing us to have better? Why, why is the old technology not allowing us to have absolutely unlimited internet everywhere that's fast, that's high quality, at a very affordable price? You know, why is the connection technologies that we use today based on old business models? I, I personally don't think that makes any sense. And I'm an accountant. I mean, are the networks today, they're not open. They're proprietary, they're old-fashioned, and they're insecure. I mean, that's what we spend most of our time talking about at these conferences. But, am I... <laughs> oh, God. Okay, when, when you're supposed to give an important talk, do not let the people who are your friends wrap you in saran wrap. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Okay, I should probably look there. But things are changing for the better. I believe that there is this better solution out there. But, like I was saying at that camp, we're going to have to do it. Because it's not going to be the people that are providing these services today that are going to bring us into the future. I mean, the kinds of people... The kinds of people that build systems that help us explore the moon and don't go back for 40 years cannot give us the network technologies that we know are possible, that everybody in here, I believe, knows are absolutely possible. We're going to have to do it ourselves, right here. Everybody who attends these congresses and hacker conferences all over the world. We know science. We do science. A lot of companies do science, but they do it not for the love and for the passion of it like we do it, but they do it for profitable purposes. Building the networks of tomorrow are going to have to happen in this community. We're all going to have to get to work doing it. And at the same time, I believe this community is also much more flat and much more transparent than the communities that are currently providing our network services. Not only are we the people who are designing a lot of these systems, but we're also users, and we're much more well acquainted with the user base. We also believe everybody should benefit. Open source technology all of these open source operatings, free software, free everything, free culture, creative commons, all of those sorts of things are powered by communities like ours. We believe everything that we create, everybody should benefit from. 
and we're very good at distributed networks. There's a lot of well-established distributed networks that I believe this community has had a very big role in, in building, creating, and using every day. IRC is a perfect example of this. You know, that's how we connect a lot of these talks with, what, with people who are watching the streams at home through IRC, and a lot of us use IRC every day. Skype example, it's evil, but it's a distributed network. Tor, another perfect example for trying to protect our privacy, trying to protect rights that a lot of people, a lot of these people that are providing these services are trying to take away from us very, very incrementally for profit or for political purposes. SETI at Home is another perfect example of a distributed network for science. Freyfunk, OSR, that's, that's something that this community directly has a hand. Can I just get a round of applause for those guys? The people are trying to provide free Wi-Fi. Because distributed mesh networks are hard. And of course, peer-to-peer -peer networks like BitTorrent and importantly, Bitcoin, you know, app making money the transfer of value, that's something that this community through Bitcoin has done really well as an experimented with and has actually put into practice and made use. Basically, all of these technologies, things that we're developing, what do we want? World domination, right? Am I right? Right? Can... And we can do that through information. And we're doing that every day through sharing information and making fast, cheap, secure. <laughs> I, I, I didn't do that intentionally, I apologize. <laughs> fast, cheap, secure, and reliable ways of making network connections accessible. That, that much is not a joke. That's something that we're working on and that we're doing every day. And even those of you, I know a lot of people at conferences like these will approach me and say, you know, I don't really feel like a hacker. I, I, you know, I don't, don't do certain things. I'm not, no, that's all of those excuses. And I've been saying this for years. All of those excuses are invalid. Every single person in this room, no matter what you assess your technical capabilities as, can help, can join, can make a difference doing it very, very easily today. It all starts with a very simple, small device right here. Oh, no, hold, bring it up, hold it. Yep. And these guys are gonna tell you all about it. Thank you guys so much for letting me open this up. I, this project means very, very much to me, and I hope after this presentation, it'll mean a lot to you. Give these guys a huge round of applause for making the first step. the first step in what will be a giant leap for hackers and a giant leap for mankind. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nick Farr. Thanks. Thank you, Nick. Uh, we decided when Nick called upon us that there is a need for space and communications in space. Uh, there were three hackers sitting on an express train to Berlin, and we've had them try and brain fart. Um, we put ourselves to the task and decided upon our goals for the next few months, and that would be understanding, building, owning, and all that open sourcing a distributed ground station network. Of course, there's a couple of short-term tasks ahead of us, which are, first of all, receive some signals, then decode the signals, understand what's in there, and then finally record and store them for later data processing. So there is a long way ahead of us, and we've identified a couple of things that we need to understand first. Satellite communication protocols, I bet there are a few. I don't know any yet. There's lots of high frequency and antenna stuff, analog and digital filters, all kinds of electronics and nastiness, also including mathematics and cryptography, that we still have to learn a lot about. So, how do you get started? It's a really, really big 
project, and there's one article, though not hardware related, but software centered, I would really like to recommend all of you reading if you're working on anything that's bigger than one page of code. It's a really awesome article by Jeff uh, Walroth, uh, Wal Wofford, <laughs> uh, on how to not get stuck. And the, the basic idea is break it down into as small packets that you can work on as possible. Uh, and as I said before, knowledge is purely optional because I can tell from my own experience, I don't know anything about HF or antennas. I build them anyway. So what do we want a ground station for? We want to do everything, but and, uh, I have to admit that Eierlegen de Wollmichsau sounds a lot more awesome than an all-purpose device. <laughs> and that will not work, so uh, we will work on something that is more like Unix and Power Rangers. Many, many small things that you can combine to something big and awesome. <laughs> so what's the most basic, basic thing that we need in a distributed system that we want? It's timing and synchronization, because there's no point at all measuring anything if you don't know the exact time that something had happened. So we need high accuracy. Let's arbitrarily select better than a microsecond. Um, an easy to use interface because we want to have every, anything exchangeable because, well, we will make errors and failures along the way and we just want to unplug something and replace it with something better along the way. Then, well, it has to be bigger and better over time. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, time source it is, and we've identified three candidates, and Relocate will take over from here. So, um, three candidates, NTP, DCF77, and GPS. And um, about NTP, NTP, we can say um, it's too simple and requires a permanent internet connection. And um, so um, we said, ah, skip, about, skip that. And uh, we went to DCF 77, which is um, the thing we know in Germany as Funkuhr. And it looked uh, like a very simple task with this protocol, because you get 59 bits per minute, and with every coming bit you know exactly, you should know exactly now the second starts. And this seems like a good thing for synchronization, but, but um, it works only in Central Europe. In other, uh, on other continents, there is other systems that work similar, but they are not synchronized to a central clock source. And there's also things with, um, with well, that um, the receivers you can buy are usually very sensitive to touching people being around them. They just uh, tend to to stop working after a while and then start again. It was a great mess. <laughs> so we decided to use GPS because there's existing hardware to do it. It's every it's possible to use it almost everywhere. And um, since we also need to know where we are, we can use it for this purpose too, so we would have needed it anyway. And um, uh, some GPS modules, modules, I think even most of them, have a super accurate pulse per second pin that goes up once a second. The problem with GPS is that it's not independent from current Earth poli politics, and uh, if current Earth politics allowed it to be, it would be more accurate and more cool, and it's also very high-frequency stuff with very strange physics and, yeah. So uh, we decided to try it out with something we knew that would work, just plug it together and um, see what it does. We used an Arduino Mega for this, 
which has four hardware serial ports that can not only be used to communicate with the GPS module, but also with uh, a computer or other microcontrollers in, this, uh, in the ground station. Without interfering with timing at the same time, because yes. that was a problem we had with uh, the Duomi Lenovo Arduino. That's right. And um, our first results looked very promising. Um, you can see here that the, uh, that the, um, the lower signal flips every second. Laser point. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, every, every time the signal changes, um, a second has passed. And you can see it's... Uh, what? I can't find it, but it's, uh, it, it is happens actually, after one second. It is actually triggering a monoflop, uh, which explains why the frequency is 500 uh, millihertz and the period is two seconds. Yes. Because the pulse uh, you get from a GPS receiver is very, very small, uh, small and you wouldn't actually see it at this uh, scale. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Um, so we know from the GPS module when the second starts and the rest of the information, like which minute, which second we can get by reading the NMEA information over the serial connection with the awesome hardware UART. <laughs> so, um, but there's more. <laughs> we have here a picture of two GPS modules um, running in parallel. They lie next to each other, so they're probably connected to the same satellites, most likely. And the oscilloscope was triggering on the first one, and as we can see, um, the timings do differ a bit, but it's about uh, yeah, 200 nanoseconds, and that's less than one microsecond, and so it's good. <laughs> yeah. Um, Okay, we have, um, uh, uh, currently we have a 16 megahertz clock driving the microcontroller, and then we can um, try to interpolate stuff, and this means we have a working time source so far. So, uh, the next step is a bit of design of the, uh, in the design of the station, of the ground station. We have to define a timing module because we want everything interchangeable. We need uh, an accurate time source to do this. We need a higher frequency clock to increase the resolution of the module and to keep track of the time. And we have to interface it with uh, I2C uh, or I2C or an interrupt or something. We'll see about that. And the next step would be defining a positioning module that tells us the position where our ground station is. And also there are uh, many possible things. You can use GPS, we can use um, GLONASS, we can use hard-coded coordinates because we have measured where the ground station stands and it's fixed there, or we can use the very new Galileo that was uh, launched a few days ago. First launch. It was, it was activated some days ago. It was activated some days ago. So, and this leads us to a ground station with these three modules. And I give back to Hardis. So uh, now we've got timing and positions. So what do we actually want to measure? Uh, satellites at this point are a little difficult because we don't have any. But there's plenty of airplanes flying around over our heads. And each of those is sending a signal uh, called ADS-B, which is just a beacon signal every commercial airliner is sending out. 
and it includes uh, besides uh, the call sign flight number uh, also the GPS position and time uh, of each plane. Uh, of course there's a couple of cons there as well because it is uh, a signal sent at roughly gigahertz and that is SHF which in German is Scheiß hohe Frequenz. <laughs> and and Scheiß hohe Frequenz is really nasty but that makes it also really awesome. Um, now, well, introducing the ham radio community, and I'm sure there are a few in here. Who is a ham radio operator? You guys are awesome. <laughs> but, yes, a round of applause for all the ham radio operators. <clears throat> um, you do awesome stuff, and some of the documentation we found is really, really obscure. Um, Here's some feedback. <laughs> we had to build an antenna. And we decided let's build a J-pole or a Slim Jim in the next iteration. Um, that's the documentation we found. How to build a J-pole antenna. It was uh, make this part here 22 centimeters, this one six and a half, and make this a centimeter or something, and then start nibbling off two parts here and one part there to tune it, and that is really obscure. <laughs> I didn't learn anything from that. So we had to spend some time reading more documentation, and then we found this. It's actually here, that's three quarters of a wavelength, and that's one quarter of a wavelength, and then you have to adjust this little bit here to get the impedance uh, down here to 50 ohms to match your cables, and that's how you actually learn something from it. So. We've learned that you shouldn't document what you did, but how you did it, because only that way we can all learn from each other, and that is the main task here. So it is work, and many hackers document their stuff similar to this, and I just kindly want to ask, get better at documenting your stuff. <laughs> um, you could also build a slim gym antenna, which is similar to the J-Pole in design, Kinda, and it got a little more gain and some other details which you can read about in the linked references in the end somewhere. Okay, we've got an antenna and now we need to receive stuff. So we found actually that same ham radio operator that we got the weird documentation from and he used old uh, satellite TV tuners to receive ADSB and decode it. Uh, we started doing that and then noticed these actually exploiting a hardware bug. It looked so good when we started. It wasn't. Anyway, uh, we bought shit and got it working. Um, this is a mini ADSB module. Um, it is kind of open. You can buy a kit, solder it. It's nice SMT components. I like that stuff. And even works in the BCC. Yes, and it even works in the BCC. You can come up to our desk and take a look at it. Yeah. And that's what it looks like. Uh, that's an airplane, if you can't tell. <laughs> anyway, um, we've got a signal. Now we need to do some more filtering and amplification because the signal we get from uh, the decoder is a little bit small. It's one, uh, 0.1 to 0.3 volts and that is not that much. Anyway, then we do some decoding measurement and then we notice, oh shit, it's the 28th. Anyway, uh, that's uh, where we are at and we actually get a lot out of this project even if, even along the way. So what do we get? We've got a distributed timing network that we can use to measure anything we want. You can measure your weather stations, airplanes, radiation, earthquakes, uh, it really doesn't matter if you're measuring satellites or whatever. And we've ha we have a plenty of GPS ground stations, if everything works out, that actually know their location. So we can do AGPS, which is assisted GPS, uh, which makes it even more accurate for all kinds of other uh, applications, because we know the position of the ground station and what the GPS thinks the position is. And we've got distributed time sources, which, well, everyone needs time. 
Next up, uh, we actually have a second ADSB receiver that we need to get working. Then we have to set up those two uh, receivers a couple of miles apart, measure some signals and calculate numbers. Then, uh, if we don't get crazy on the way because it's so much high frequency stuff, uh, we'll try harder and build more and there will probably be many, many dragons. And so far, there's been quite some collateral damage. We got lots of contacts into the uh, ham radio community and the satellite community. Uh, we've built three antennas so far, despite our utter lack of knowledge. Uh, we've got two ADSB receivers, as said before. Uh, we've got several GPS uh, setups and many, many filters, some of which don't actually filter. <laughs> um, then we've got a GPS module that is made specifically for timing that we're going to take a look at. Uh, we've got one hacker lost in the lands of FPGA design because we need higher clock rates. And we've got one hacker lost to horology, which is the art of measuring time. <laughs> uh, he actually found a really nice paper, 100 pages. Yeah, tons of fun. <laughs> anyway, it's too much for us to do. And there's this little stuff that we got the first try of getting anything to work. Lots of receivers and crap. It's fun to take that stuff apart. Anyway, how to contribute? Uh, you can do the usual stuff. Write code, talk to us, help us, share your expertise if you have any. I'm sure you have. And finally, if everything works out, set up a ground station. And we actually do have one guy here that has an application for all of this already. Andreas. Okay, now it's my turn. Like presented before, you know how to do it with hardware, but you want to have it distributed. So I will tell, tell that later. So what the fuck are we doing here right now? So we want to build a real space application. So we want to have telemetry and tracking and with a real purpose for my uni university, University of Stuttgart, there's a small satellite project at the IRS. That's the Institute of Space uh, Systems. And they want to build a small satellite and we want to track and do telemetry with it when it's done in orbit. And we want to determine the orbital elements that's called Kaplan elements that define the orbit. And we want to have the amateur radio community included in this all. And we want to have it externally tracking and positioning because um, it has some benefits with it. So why do we want to do it? So why not? So first of all, it's positioning. When the satellite is ejected into the orbit, sometimes you don't really know where the launcher is heading you to. So you, you, you're bored in orbit and sometimes you're not there. And uh, you want to know where the launcher put you to. So relatively fast after the positioning uh, of orbit injection, you want to have the positioning. So um, like you can see here before uh, on, the, on the slide, um, when there are so small variants inside, you are not aiming with your dish directly to the satellites, and so you don't get any connections at all. And we want to have it globally, and we want to have an independent service. Then afterwards, when the tracking is possible, we want to have also some kind of communication with the satellites. In this case, it's a so-called data dump mode. We want to get signals from the satellite, like um, some housekeeping data, the temperatures inside, and some other really important data that would be pro um, will be sent down. Then our distributed ground station network over there could fill in some gaps between the main nodes the satellite uh, owner already rented, so you can fill some gaps over there. And in the very, very last end of it, we want to have a possibility to command satellites. Okay, that's a really, really high um, expectation here. And there's almost nothing more important than data rates in space, so you could help us doing this and achieving it to be somehow a little bit uh, cheaper then. And the last thing is, of course, to serve man in, in general, to have a telemetry and tracking of satellites for everybody, some data rates beyond this current objectives, of course, and a science platform. And that's a picture how it's done currently. So there's big yeah, satellite dish on some fields. That's a resting satellite earth station. And we want to have something like this. That's uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, 
that's somewhere nearby in Berlin, like Köln, and everybody should contribute, like, not perhaps with his tel uh, television satellite dishes, but with some other kind of antennas these guys are building right now. So, how do we start? First of all, we need four dots, and these dots are reception stations. And um, we want to have some kind of reverse GPS, so you need, to have, you need to have at least four GPS satellites and a handheld device, and with four, um, with four GPS um, satellites sending signals to your handheld device. Your handheld device can calculate where it is, so we want to have it backwards. Your handheld device will send out something to the antenna to the reception station, and then we will calculate it backwards. And this is done via so pseudo ranging, it's so-called, and we have to have at least four stations because it's in 3D. And uh, this is, uh, it's, it's easy somehow, but it's, some, uh, it's solving lots of linear equations with matrices. So, that is, not, that is nothing new. So, the so-called Apollonius of Perga did this some thousand years ago, and his finding is already available in the internet, and uh, there are some other papers describing how it will be done. So, it won't end with four dots, we need to have U at some point, because you want to have more reception stations distributed all over the world. Because then we can enhance the accuracy of everything through multi-reception points, and then it will become a combinatorial problem with some exponential um, deterministic behavior. So the more stations you got, the more the computer has to calculate afterwards, but like shown here, your yeah, your position accuracy will be much, much better, or at least we hope so. And now it's my turn. I am from the Constellation platform that's already existing right now. We want to turn this basis and do this into a sensor grid. And um, we are a student group. We are a DGLR, that's the German Aerospace Society group, a young academics group, and we do applied sciences and use oriented aerospace research right now. And it's a really interdisciplinary collaboration like said before, DGLR, Rechenkraft.net, SafeNet, some of them are already here, and uh, of course, Shackspace. So it's really, really interesting. And what we're basically doing is this, but that's not our machine. That's the HLRS, that's a supercomputer also based in Stuttgart. And they are on the 12th place in the top 500 ranking. They have uh, about 800 teraflops, but they cost 30 millions. And we are this small. Because we are relying on your computers, I will tell you afterwards. We have two teraflops right now, that's no so in this range, but we only cost 300 euros, so it's rather cheap in this position. So, and how do we do it? We do distributed computing with Boink, I think everybody knows this, so you guys are donating idle PC time to science, in this case to our system, and we have about 2,000 users and 5,000 host PCs, and if we only can make 10% of them, plugging in the antenna these guys are building, then we have a huge basis already distributed in about 66 countries all over the world. And currently they have nothing to do, just spending some idle time for a so-called um, ascent trajectory optimizer for a uh, high-end student group at our university, and I'm doing the thrust optimization of them for the hybrid rocket system. So we could possibly and hopefully turn some of them and plugging in the antennas, so we also already get some distributed computing system of, of, um, as a basis of this. And uh, we want to have the sensor data processed also on our system, and we also want to make these data available in raw form. So you can, only, uh, you can already uh, start doing some good things for science currently right now. So this is nothing new, this has already been done. The Quakecatcher network is already doing this with some uh, accelerometers built in in some Macs or with a small USB device you can plug in anywhere. And that's my favorite. It's called radioactive at home. You can measure radioactive background stuff at your home. So that's nothing new. We just you have this as another application. So going back to you, and we need some more help with volunteers. That are you amateur radio uh, experts and of course exp uh, institutes like universities and other uh, important persons. And we want to have antenna modes 
is fix single antenna, that's the basic stuff everybody can participate in. Fix triple directional antennas, that will be more costly because there are three of them, but they give us more um, possibilities afterwards. And of course, motorized single directional antennas with high gain antennas like satellite dishes, that will be done by the um, institutes because they're really big and expensive. And with this kind of hybrid antenna mode, we expect that the accuracy will be much better afterwards. And the expected sensor grid we want to have um, is at least 1,000, but over 9,000 would be very, very appreciated. Okay. Um, we are also thinking about doing some more mathematics. So there's this whole one-way ranging, sending something from Earth to the satellites and back. But we are not in the sending mode right now, but we are already uh, thinking about it. So so-called one-way Doppler uh, system from the French guys um, using this for Doris. Multi-way ranging, that is what we expect with the distributed sensor system as well. And uh, we have some contact with Dr. Sakamoto from Tohoku University in Japan, who, just, uh, who does some crazy stuff and good things with Doppler shift experiments. I'm not really knowing anything about because I don't understand it, but it's working because he's doing it right now. And when you have some ideas how we could do this, give me an email, please. So why do we do it? For science, of course and for other reasons, like I presented before. Okay, now to give you some impression where we are placed, because you can say, perhaps there is a system currently doing this. Yes, of course, you can do it with inertial measurement systems. And I think some of you already do and, um, with UAVs and so on. And of course, the uh, space-based satellite navigation system like GPS or GLONASS, at, um, the GPS is um, operated by the US de uh, Department of Defense and GLONASS is now controlled by the Roscosmos, the space agency of Russia. And they have something in common. When your satellite gets lost, because everything is stored on the satellite, you don't get any bad data back. So it's nothing worse when you know where you are when you're not sending it to the, uh, to the satellite owner afterwards. So, we want to have it externally, and uh, the um, governmental agencies are already doing this with NOAA and United States Strategic Command. They're tracking everything with radars that's greater than two centimeters, like a coin, or uh, the European uh, Space Tracking S track, and the so called Doris of the CNES, like I mentioned before. So they have different objectives, different functions, and they are under different management. And the distributed ground station network could become a new player in between them with the decentralized responsibilities. So what else can we do afterwards when we're really um, achieving our goals? There are some crazy papers on the internet I really love, like atmospheric measurements or just measuring the accuracy of the GPS itself, because it's also important so, because you want to know when something is uh, going blurry on your radar. Then environmental monitoring by wireless communication networks that they proved that you can already um, do measurements in the atmosphere with UMTS and GPS. So it's basically the same. We have to just to figure out how the frequency is playing in this. Perhaps thunderstorm strikes and cell detection, or that's my favorite nuclear detonation detection. I'm not sure how it works, but I found a paper explaining this, and I would really love to detect one. So, not, <laughs> not because the detection, but I want to prove somebody is playing a world in their foregarden. Okay. We talked about the antenna system. We also need a beacon. That's a concept. Nothing more. We want to transmit something. We need a protocol for it. We have to establish a data rate. Um, but um, we need for the complete cycle and, of course, for the use data, that's important. And the ham radio community know OSCAR, that's the orbital satellite carrying, carrying amateur radio. I would also like to have an own ID for our purposes. And in this case, there are some uh, other interdisciplinary partners, the Aerospace Lab in Stuttgart-Herrenberg. They are high school students, and we want to have them build and helping us with the beacon itself. And the beacon itself should be as simple as possible to have more possibilities with it because I will come to this later. And now you can, uh, could ask us, okay, do you really think you can do this? Yes, of course. There's a fun cube that's a small satellite lying on the floor there. It's built um, in the United Kingdom. And they have something called the fun cube dongle. It's such small. 
and they already can receive signals from space, so with some data weights in it. So it's very, very possible to do this. And now for the future perspective, besides the time measuring, the first thing I would love to have is uh, checking satellites, of course, checking aircrafts that's currently being done, then helping science experiments or weather balloon, that's uh, a Rexos and Bexos campaign, that's a rocket and balloon experiment for university students. You can apply for it for a small slot and put your experiment on board both, and perhaps that's a really nice test bed for us later on, for our beacon and also tracking them. UAVs, these guys, the UAV NG is are currently doing some great job, some stairs up, and of course for the Stuttgart Adler, that's also a, a plane, a small plane, and um, we also would like to help them as well. Of course, open street map, because when you have a beacon that's really, really um, small, uh, put, uh, fitting into your pocket, you can do your walk around and then checking where you have been, and then helping OpenStreetMap doing the, material, the mapping stuff, and like mentioned before, the differential GPS, improving your GPS system, and of course, animal tracking. Future perspective and chances beyond the system, so our platform constellation could be the first application for the distributed ground station network, but it's not exclusively done for us, because spin-offs and dairy weights should be done for everybody. And like I said before, I would love to have some um, small devices, and in this case, a so-called fast deployable antenna, wolf antenna, you can just implement here and then checking the UAVs upstairs. Okay, and we want, it, uh, want, if we want to uh, um, have it with you, by you, and for everyone, of course. What I've learned so far is interdisciplinary collaboration works very well with hackers, science, and volunteers, and I'm really grateful for this. Almost everything is already available. We just have to bring it together in a sensible way. We have to keep on working because it's hard, but it's really doable. So your communities are really great because you have a lot of support for the constellation platform from the check space and possibly for you. And of course, space works. So, I'm done. So, now it's time for some wide questioning, and thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Um, we do have time for a few more questions. Please put your hand up if you have any. We have a question from the IRC right away. I'll Get down to you. Okay, Datenwolf is asking why you rely on governmentally controlled clock sources. Um, he thinks that high precision clocks are affordable and rubidium frequency uh, clocks normally go for about $150. Uh, yes, why are we relying on this? Uh, it's simple. We had it lying around. And it works really, really well because GPS is meant to be a time distribution network. Um, we also could use a module using, the similar inter uh, using a similar interface that is based on GLONASS or Galileo or the Chinese variant. And it is very unlikely, at least in the beginning, that all these governments would turn off something at the same time. Uh, so we just used that to get started. Hope that answers the question. In the back? Yeah. Um, I have to thank you guys, because uh, with your work on timing, you might have done about half of my diploma thesis, which I started right now. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Seriously. Um, we are working on a um, network of uh, close by um, but distributed nodes of a uh, detector for a cosmic ray incident light. So uh, we are looking for Cherenkov light coming in from uh, proton collisions in the upper atmosphere. And the easiest way to get good precision is to get a bunch of uh, detector stations which you place at a couple meters or a couple hundred meters from each other uh, in a huge area. The system that we are hoping to deploy, we're going to be testing in uh, some part of uh, southern Siberia. Um, and actually for the timing that we've been thinking about, nothing much has worked out yet, which is why it's perfect that uh, I got to see this talk. 
Um, we were thinking about a two-stage uh, timing system where you would have uh, one PPS or maybe 100 PPS uh, level accuracy from GPS or uh, satellite systems and then a second level system that gets us down to hopefully one nanosecond which is what we need for evaluating our signals. Um, and I think the system that you described with, with the Arduino board, which is perfect because we've been struggling with closed hardware, um, could serve as a uh, first level module or even the timing module of uh, some maybe not so time critical science applications. Uh, so I'd really love to get in touch with you because you could do uh, stuff that helps astrophysics a lot because uh, these distributed uh, cheap uh, detector stations which you distribute over, over a large area is probably where uh, astroparticle physics is going to go uh, by large parts. So yeah, great. Here we are. <laughs> that is good to hear that people actually are needing this and not it's, it, and it's not just us having brain farts. <laughs> so uh, feel free, by all means, to uh, come upstairs to our uh, desk. You, you can not miss it if you look for the big posters. And we'll have a talk. Any more questions? Yes, we, we do have more questions uh, from the IRC. That's uh, 28C3, SAR2 in this case, on Freenode. Um, so, Fidipus asks what he has to do to become a dot in the grid. He wants to build hardware. That is good. That is a good question. Uh, talk to us, probably, would be a good start. Um, he can sign up for this mailing list here. It's public. Just sign up there, ask us questions, or come up to us here at the Congress, and uh, we'll talk about the details. Everyone is very welcome to join. There's too much work for just us to do. Uh, we have another question from the audience up front. Yes, uh, this reverse constellation and positioning you were talking about, at least for positioning, right? So that means it's at least a bi-directional communication between all the ground station and this one flying notebook, right? Uh, what's, what's the frequency band and uh, the output, uh, the field strength? intended to have. Okay. Um, the reverse GPS is just an example to present you how it's done. But every antenna these guys are building have to have a small device that's really measuring your position or you have to put it in because you know the time when the signal is going to the antenna from our beacon and the position of each and every antenna. And then you can calculate it. No. We just have to receive it from somewhere. So manually putting in, uh, that's some, some, something really very difficult for some persons. But when we put in a GPS or whatever, like donut system and so on, it's also um, already or also measuring the position itself. So um, we don't have to be di bidirectional because then it's sending and we don't have the license for this yet. So, so we're talking about just receiving, just receiving and listening to whatever is uh, going to the antenna. Yes, at this point, we don't have any intentions of uh, violating any laws by sending stuff. <laughs> that is maybe coming in the future. Who knows? <laughs> okay, another question from the audience at the back. Um, you mentioned that you looked at NTP for time synchronization um, and rejected it as too imprecise. Uh, did you look at alternative protocols in that area. I remember vaguely seeing papers and other, yeah, about other approaches of the same kind though. One thing that was very important to us was that the uh, ground station should be um, independent for, uh, at least independent for a while from an internet connection. Like um, you could just take it somewhere with you where you don't have any internet connection or the internet connection is unreliable and just in, it saves data and timing information and any stuff and then it sends it when it gets to the internet again it sends it back on the point network and the information is then processed uh, so since we need uh, to keep the clocks constantly in sync um, it would be bad to be um, dependent from, an in, from the internet or any other network. 
And, and to add to this, um, the um, described Vexus and Vexus campaign, they are starting from the northern part of uh, Sweden, and there is no internet. And I would like to have this small deployable antennas there when we are doing this and hopefully doing this. And we would to have a menu, a modular, so then you have GPS module you can stick in or some other sources. And uh, it just depends on your application you want to do with it. Yes, yeah, so it's a little bit of a chicken egg problem because we want to get rid of the cable bound internet. And if we depend on internet for our most basic thing, the timing, that is kind of a problem. Does this answer your question? Okay, it does. We do have another question from the uh, IRC. Um, Bibor wants to know if you ever heard of MSAT. It's, um, I think, an organization who are working, uh, who's working in high infrastructure and yeah, know-how for satellite communication. And if you have ever thought of working with them. Um. Yes, of course, we have heard of them. The Fun Cube is also somehow related to it. And first of all, we want to have it working. So we were already talking to some people, and we would love to talk to them as well. But we want to have at least some achievement. So give, give us some time, please. Yeah, we just started hacking and then started talking to people. And now it's working at the same time, but yeah. As time goes by, we uh, get more and more contacts. If, if you want to put us towards any group that is already doing this, please do feel free to send us an email. Yes. And write another question. OK, I have two small questions. Um, double Z, double O wants to know how, or if you know um, about the time stabilization in, on the satellite and how this is done, I don't know. And uh, Philippus um, added um, to his uh, previous question if you are developing uh, a model layout for a ground station or if you're planning to do so. Um, we don't know yet about the time stabilization on set, but, well, we don't have satellites yet, so that wasn't a question that we ask ourselves. And we are work. Do you have any? But when this person is knowing this, he can help us, so. <laughs> Yes, if anybody knows this, well, do share. Uh, the second question was, are we, what? If you're planning on doing a model layout for the ground station or, yeah. Yes, uh, this, this is the basic idea that we want to build some very, very simple interfaced modules for timing, for getting the position of the ground station and for plugging in any possible kind of measurement system that you want to use, be it satellite or your weather station, and go from there. Okay, I see we do ha not have any more questions. If you do not want to ask a question in public, just come after uh, the talk. Thanks again. Thank you.